uh, uh, cup chick. I'm the first select woman of Fairfield. And one, I've done a couple of these for different areas in our town because people had questions regarding 8-30G developments and didn't uh, particularly understand the entire statute and things of that nature. And we're getting a lot more of it coming into the office. And on top of that, we're also, I'm also seeing a lot of questions come in about legislation pending in Hartford. So I thought it would be a good idea to host this forum for our community to have an opportunity to listen a little and to ask questions. So I'm going to just say uh, thank you to our panelists who came on. Uh, uh, if you didn't see the flyer, we have um, a state Senator Tony Wong here. We have uh, Representative Laura Devlin, State Representative Kristen McCarthy Vahey, and Representative um, Jennifer Leeper. And on the town side, we have uh, Mark Barnhart, who is our Director of Economic Development, Jim Went, who is our Director of Planning and Zoning, who are both intricately involved in these uh, types of um, issues in our town. And we have the Chairman of the Town Planning and Zoning Commission, who has seen a lot of action. Um, on our Planning and Zoning Commission regarding 8-30G um, developments. And so I thought it would be important for them uh, in, in our delegation to be here for this conversation. So um, I I could have uh, our, our what I've done in the past was have Mark Barnhart discuss a little bit about the 8-30G statute, what it is and how it works. And, um, and then I had... Uh, Jim Went and uh, Matt Wagner talk a little bit about their experiences, but I know we are time constrained. If, if people want to have that, we can do that, or we can go right to questions. And I'll leave it up um, to to the panelists. Um, if, if I may, uh, Madam sure. First Select Woman, uh, this is uh, State Senator Tony Wong. I, I think it's important for us to hear from town leaders and and the town perspectives and also member of our affordable housing task force. Look, we live these kind of proposals, particularly for Reverend McCarthy Bay, he and I as the chair, she's the chair and the ranking of planning and zoning, the various bills that we have. But I think it's, it's most important for us to hear from our planning and zoning chair, Mark, the economic development and members of the affordable housing task force to share with things that you have done as a town so that we can have some background, but also what some of these proposals of which you have done a really good job in articulating and give us insight and, and give us your thoughts for us to be able to properly represent you up in Hartford. If that's okay through you, Madam First Select Woman. Well, that's fine. Uh, Mark, do you wanna uh, talk a little um, just well, about Maybe I can talk a little bit about the work of the Affordable Housing Committee, what we've done, and, and what yes. we're um, already uh, embarking on an update to our housing plan. So, um, you know, the affordable ta the town has had an affordable housing committee or task force since the mid 1980s, and one of the first communities in the state of Connecticut to do so, and produced an affordable housing plan back in 1988. Uh, again, probably one of the first communities in the state of Connecticut to do so. Uh, and since that time, you know, has been engaged. It's a largely advocacy group, uh, largely engaged in terms of supporting housing, or more precisely, promoting housing choice, housing diversity, uh, housing options in, in Fairfield. And so the town has done a number of things over the years, uh, both serving as a developer of affordable housing, uh, doing some very innovative things like doing property swaps to encourage um, certain types of affordable housing. Um, and, you know, developing its own property for that purpose. In 2014, the Affordable Housing Committee uh, updated its affordable housing plan using a state grant, uh, which we got uh, with the help of our uh, legislative delegation up in Hartford. Um, we used that to produce uh, an update to our plan, and, and in that report, there were a series of 11 action steps uh, that the town could do on its own uh, to help promote more housing diversity here and more housing opportunities for uh, Fairfield residents. And I'm happy to report that uh, we made substantial progress in the, in the intervening years. So we have, since that report was adopted, created more than affordable, more than 100 affordable units here in town. 
uh, we are well on our way to achieving a moratorium status, which uh, we can talk about a little bit uh, as it relates to 830G. Um, and some of the things that we did working in concert with the Planning and Zoning Commission uh, were to uh, enact an inclusionary zoning regulation that requires any development of 10 or more units to set aside at least 10% of the housing as affordable housing uh, within that development. That way it can be uh, developed naturally as part of the private development process and scattered throughout town. So it's not imposing a burden on any particular area or neighborhood. Uh, the commission also uh, created an inclusionary zoning regulation uh, that uh, requires um, any new construction or building addition that doesn't otherwise provide for affordable housing to set aside or provide a fee, a supplemental fee that goes into a dedicated housing trust fund. And that housing trust fund currently has a balance of roughly $675,000 at the present time which the town can then use to help promote or create affordable housing opportunities here in town. In addition to that, uh, again, working with the commission and with uh, groups like uh, the Fairfield Senior Advocates and Fair Plan, uh, the commission also amended its regulations as it relates to accessory dwelling units to make it easier for those units to be established in town. And so we have more than 200 uh, for more legal accessory dwelling units in town, we're looking to grow that inventory. And while that may not contribute formally to our affordable housing inventory, it does provide a modicum of housing options for especially seniors that may be a cost burden and living in town looking for different options. So all those things do help uh, contribute to our affordable housing inventory. As I mentioned, we um, are working towards a moratorium. The state statutes allow for communities to apply for and receive a moratorium under 830G if you accumulate sufficient number of housing unit equivalency points that are equal to 2% of the number of housing units in town as of the last uh, decennial census. In the case of Fairfield, we need 433 points and we are just shy of uh, of that at that mark at the present time, we have uh, we have about 56 points left to go, uh, based on our projections, in order for us to apply. And what's important here is that we can only count those units that are either newly deed restricted or placed into service after July 1 of 1990. So, in order for us to count units under construction, we have to wait for them to be built and placed into service or occupied before we can out actually count those units. So we have a number of projects that either have either been approved or, or under construction that will count towards our moratorium points, but we're only able to count those units once they actually get a T of O or certificate of occupancy. So I don't wanna monopolize the conversation, but that's just an overview of where we are. I should say that the Affordable Housing Committee, because there is a state requirement that communities update their affordable housing plans every five years. Uh, we are currently embarking on a new affordable housing plan update. Uh, we just retained a consultant to assist us and work with the Planning and Zoning Commission and Affordable Housing Committee to do that. And we hope to deliver that plan uh, to the Board of Selectmen by early next year. And with that, I'll defer to others. Thank you, Mark. Um so I, hope, I think that gives a nice uh, perspective. And we had done that on the prior uh, neighborhood meetings we've had discussing this statute. I know so many residents in our community don't really understand it until it, it comes to their neighborhood and then they want to know a lot about it. So it's always good to have that perspective, to hear what it is, to hear what the town is, it has done and continues to do. And we are working very hard to try to increase our own affordable housing um, that is being built through the town. But again, it's a, it's a, you know, it's like the dog chasing its tail. We're trying really hard um, to get there. And as Mark said, if every single thing that has passed through the planning and zoning was CO and built in CO, we would would be able to apply for the moratorium. But we're just not there yet. And in that in that in this period of time, these applications just keep coming and coming. So I would like to, um, if we don't mind, if if. If no one minds, I, I do want to, I think I would like to open it up because I think it'll spur conversation and it'll allow us to all have a dialogue. I'm going to um, go to this chat here um, 
and Bob is uh, Bob asks a question. Um, the Connecticut General Assembly presenters, in your opinion, why has the state zoning reform become such a wedge issue? And what is what is one concrete action you can take to help achieve progress towards state and local zoning reform? So I'm going to open that up to the delegation. Um, Senator Wong, do you want to? A absolutely. It's it's a very emotionally charged issue. And uh, Madam First Select Woman, when you and I were working together um, in the housing committee, uh, we did uh, approach and try to create solutions for the current A30G statue. And that was nearly a five year journey. Uh, and indeed, we did make some uh, statutory changes. In fact, it was the only bill that overrode the eight years of Governor Malloy's um, uh, uh, legacy. But that being said, the, the current proposal um, reflects the failure of A30G. It just did not meet the solutions. And let me be clear, we have a critical housing need in every part of our state, not only in our suburbs, but in our urban settings, in our rural communities. And I believe, as what's mentioned here earlier by Mark, the incredible efforts that's been made by the town of Fairfield and many other communities can more be done? Absolutely. But it can only be reaching our goals, a collaborative effort between neighborhoods, the state, local and federal entities to make it all work. The idea of the current proposals, why it's so emotionally charged, is the premise that the state has enabling powers on zoning and planning and that they are granting that to our local authorities which is a premise that I find difficult to accept because the idea of the state, Hartford and its advocates, well-intentioned advocates, knowing every nuance and unique aspect of each of the respective local communities better than our local planning and zoning boards, conversation entities, economic development uh, leaders is, is a false premise. The idea that we should all work together needs to be the premise. But unfortunately, the bills that are being proposed right now by the legislative majority is one where one size fits all and the state has a better idea than local efforts that we're undertaking. So, you know, we can talk a little more about that, but, but my overall perspective is the reason it's been termed as a wedge issue because it's deeply personal. It's one about local control of planning and zoning authorities and conservation, as well as individual personal property rights. The emotion of individuals who have done everything right in taking care of their home and, and property and did everything right in following the rules of their local community can literally under currently A30G and the current proposals that are being uh, discussed in the legislative body can override people's personal property rights. That's deeply emotional and you can see that in the reactions of many people that we've interacted with. And I welcome the perspective of other of my colleagues as well. And I want to thank you very much, uh, Madam First Select Woman, for having this opportunity for us as a legislative body representing you in Hartford to hear the voices of the people that we truly want to represent. Thank you, Senator. Um, does any uh, does anyone? Uh, well, I just want to say for the record, Senator Wong is the ranking member on the Planning and Development Committee that a lot of proposals uh, that affect us in in this area went through. And uh, Christy mccarthy Vehi is the chairwoman, um, co-chairwoman of the Planning and Development uh, Committee. Uh, Kristen, do you wanna uh, jump in? Yes, and I, I'm more of a Zoom gal myself and I wanna make sure you can hear me, Madam First Woman. Yes. yes. Okay, great. And I, I took, I listened to Jennifer Carpenter's instructions and I called in. So that's why you see the earbuds in my ears. I know it looks kind of funny, but it's, I guess the look we're all used to these days. First of all, I just want to thank you, um, Mark, Jim, Matt, and the delegation members for joining in this conversation and for all the people who are joining us and who are paying attention and caring about these issues. Particularly, uh, I give a special shout out to Matt and to our volunteer members of the TPNZ and our ZBA, the people who are our community members who help us implement uh, the, the federal and state and local frameworks that help us plan for our future. Um, to, to get back to Bob's question, 
So, um, Kristen, if I'm you sure. wouldn't mind, can we try to encompass that? And also, I'm going to just jump in and throw in, um, it said, can legislators walk us through the bills they are considering in Hartford and how they impact Fairfield? So if you could kind of put that into with the previous question, and then we'll bring it all around. I'll do my best. I don't want to filibuster the conversation. Just so down. I just I'm trying happy. to open it up so we. Because <laughs> I could probably talk for a long time about all that, Madam First Select Woman. Um, but so the first, the the first question, just to get to that, um, and thanks to everyone for the questions. Um, you know, I think that the the idea of land use as something that is deeply personal is true. And I think it's also something that's absolutely communal because we know that um, the way we regulate our land is something that impacts one another. And when I think about, you know, talking about the proposals in Hartford and some of that, um, there are a lot of different things on the table. And I'm really interested in us having an opportunity tonight to hopefully talk about some of those specific items. When we talk about the state enabling legislation, that's literally the name of the 8-2 statute. And I know earlier Mark talked about 830G. 8-2 uh, is what's known as the state enabling legislation. Uh, much as the federal government gives and powers to the state, the state gives powers to the municipalities. And in fact, nothing in these um, proposals is going to change the fact that ultimately our local, local municipalities and those boards will have to write our regulations and implement uh, any state law. I often use the example of curriculum, and I know um, as a former, we have a couple of former Board of Ed members here on the call, uh, when we have a bill right now in Hartford to define what is in federal or in our state curriculum, but it is the municipalities, our Boards of Ed, who actually write that curriculum. Much is the same is true with the 8-2 piece. Uh, I think I, I want to touch on something else that Senator Wong said in terms of individual property rights. Um, ironically, some of the things that are being proposed in Hartford are in some other places in the country being um, supported by folks who do believe in more, uh, in less regulation and in more ability for people to do as they choose with their property. So I think that this is a really important issue because as long as there are humans on the planet, we're going to be talking about how we use our land and how we share space with one another and how we decide who, what, when, and where we choose to develop and change. And I think there's one of the piece to all in terms of change. Um, lots of folks in our hearings, and Senator Wong and I have had uh, an opportunity to spend dozens of hours together and we've heard from hundreds of people around our state and through our online hearings, but also in person and in lots of forums. And I think there's often um, conversation and, and some folks who get upset when we talk about fear of change. And I, rather than talking about fear of change, I think it, part of these proposals are looking at the inevitability of change. And just to tie this back to one thing Mark said, and then I'll Stop because I know other folks want to talk, but I can happily talk more about the proposals. Um, Mark talked about Fairfield's history of having an affordable housing plan, which is tremendous. And when I was a select person, I helped found our bike pedestrian committee. And I went to another community who had a long time committee, and they said, the first thing you have to do is have a plan. And what I loved hearing about from Mark is the last plan that we had had action steps for our community. And the community didn't just have the plan, our community took the plan and put it into action. And um, I think that's really, really important that Fairfield is ahead of so many other communities in that. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it there for now. I'm happy to talk more. Uh, I, don't, I wanna let other folks have a chance to talk, but then I'm happy to talk more about the specifics um, that are still alive. Some of the bills have died. Okay, so um, I want to open it up to the other legislators too, but I just want to make sure I'm not missing. Um... Thank you. So can I jump in? Yes, I just uh, they said, could you give some specifics how um, these bills would uh, remove local control, 
And then another one, um, uh, some links are provided, but then um, elaborate on how personal property rights will be protected in the proposed bills. Uh, they, the language embedded in these bills says otherwise. Do we, okay. Um, I, I, listen, I wanna bring it, let Laura speak and then Jen speak, but I think that it would be helpful because um, Senator Wong and Kristen are both um, members of the committee that had a lot of this. If you could maybe talk about the ones that are still alive and maybe point counterpoint about what you think, if, if you think it's good and if you don't think it's good and why, maybe that would be helpful. So first of all, let me say thank you for hosting this. I know that we were contacted by local residents, constituents who were very concerned. They're hearing all sorts of things about this and don't really understand what's the, what's the big picture, what's the real picture. Can we filter out the sound bites and actually get to some of the facts? And this is a challenging issue. It is certainly an emotional issue. And I think one of the things is that the 830G statute has failed. And what we're seeing even in the town of Fairfield to reach a, a imposed threshold, Mark, what are we getting? 900 apartments that are coming into Fairfield? It does so little to, it certainly brings new apartments that are market rate, that is very expensive. Um, but that really outweighs the affordable housing and does so little to incent or create or help build home ownership, which we hear so much is so important for intergenerational wealth. So there seems to be all of these things coming, you know, from different directions with uh, different objectives. And what would be really ideal is for everybody to sit down, look at what exists, look at some of the proposals and say, what makes sense? But one of the things with this legislation, I don't serve on the Planning and Development Committee, um, but there is an organization who is very active in promoting this legislation, and they have an omnibus bill that did go, and what I mean by that has multiple, multiple pieces that did go to the Planning and Development Committee. But the way that our legislature works sometimes is that the majority has also taken many of those pieces and submitted them as separate bills through multiple committees. So they are hitting education, housing, planning and development, finance, transportation. It's, it's unbelievable in terms of the breadth. And the, um, I think a couple of, I guess the big theme is that, you know, one of the beauties of our state, we don't have counties, we have 169 unique and different towns or cities. They might be rural communities. They can be bustling suburban communities. They can be our cities that we desperately need to revitalize. And what, what all of this legislation seems to seek is sort of a Hartford driven, one size fits all approach that either, either the Office of Policy and Management or that maybe the Department of Transportation or the Department of Housing is going to tell our towns the framework which with they have to work in. And it is said commonly that, oh no, towns have a choice, this isn't being taken away. But if you're told that you can do A, B, or C, that's it, A, B, or C, is that really a choice? Is it really freedom for our towns to decide what is the right thing to do? Um, there were some very controversial pieces in this big chunk of legislation, such as if you imagine our downtown in Fairfield, right, on top of the seven to 900 apartments that are coming very soon, uh, there would be as of right development, which is code for no public hearings, just build what you want for multifamily housing within a half a mile of a train station, or at least 50% of the land within a half a mile of a train station. Or consider Black Rock Turnpike, big commercial area, right? As of right, no public hearings, build whatever you want within a half a mile. So, um, and also parking is a big deal. I was on a forum this morning with Rep McCarthy Vahey actually about our library, not to digress, um, but it is about the strategic plan for our library, which is such an incredible asset to our town. And somebody, one of the first comments was fix the parking. And these proposals also try to take away any parking requirements, which just means it's kind of a free for all. So there's some important pieces. I look forward to Senator Wong and Rep McCarthy Vahey sort of outlining more specifically what's in this legislation. 
And at some point, you know, maybe we should have a document that is point by point. Like, what does this stuff mean? Translate it from the legislative language into lay people's <laughs> regular terminology so that they can understand. And I know there is one organization who has done that with a point of view, but maybe we want to look at it a little bit more holistically. So thank, thank you, Representative uh, Dublin. As always, you're very lively <laughs> and on point. <laughs> Uh, um, uh, uh, Je uh, Jennifer, uh, Representative Leeper, would you want to jump in and offer some comments? Uh, happy to. Thank you so much, Brenda, for bringing us all together. And I think I'm going to try to actually answer that first question that Bob asked um, about this being a wedge issue and what we can do to help um, move past that. And I think this type of forum with all of us here together is exactly exactly the type of thing we can do to help break down some of the myth on both sides, like Rep Devlin was just mentioning, and really get to the facts of what does this mean for our community? What does it mean for our state? We all recognize that we have an affordable housing crisis. We're 130,000 units short of where we should be for people to have access to affordable housing. And that we know right here in our community, it is a a relevant and urgent need for our seniors amongst other groups um, to have access to more affordable housing. And as has been described, our community has taken that seriously. And we have taken many steps to try to integrate more affordable housing into our community. I think part of why this has become such a wedge issue is there's really been, I think across all sectors over the past many, many years, a, a breakdown in trust. And so depending on what your your view is or your tribe might be, depends on whose voices you trust. And it also impacts whose voices you might inherently not trust. And, and I think we've been seeing a lot of that. We have people going around holding regional rallies about local control, telling people this is going to destroy your personal property rights. That's terrifying. We all have almost all of our capital tied up in our homes. And not only is it our biggest financial asset, it's deeply personal. Having served on the Board of Ed, I'm often telling people who reach out to me, I know there is nothing that strikes at our hearts more than our children and our homes. And so this is one of those issues that is so deeply personal. And so I am grateful for the opportunity for all of us to come together and try to break down some of the myth on both of both sides because we all live we all live in Connecticut and Fairfield by choice. We we are we've talked about this before, all from other states and, and selected to live here because it's such a wonderful place. And we want to ensure that it continues to be a wonderful place. And we all agree affordable housing is important. And so what are the actual steps we can take to make sure we are bringing more affordable housing into our community in a way that is fitting um and i think i'll leave it there for now thank you okay thank you um so all right so there were two things brought up um is that is that the uh, is that the senate tony all right so uh two bills uh hb 6611 was brought up here in the chat and then um senate bill 1024 can we, can we, uh, can we talk about these? So why don't, if, I don't know, Senator Long, I'm having a little bit of internet issues. I think um, some of your videos keep coming in and out. Senator Long, are you still there? I, I, I am here, but uh, we are about to go cast a vote. So if you can forgive me. Uh, I will actually have to exit for a few minutes. Um, okay. So thank you. It's the peril of uh, legislative session right now. So I apologize. I'll be right back. Okay. Thanks, Tony. You're, do, you're doing your job. You're you're doing your job. Um, so, Madam, for select moment, if I may, just yes. speak directly to some of the bills back to you had asked me before, and I wanted to just let other folks have a chance to speak. So a couple things, and I I went through this with a resident recently. I always recommend to folks to go on the Connecticut General Assembly webpage, and at the bottom of the page, there's a little box that says bill, and you can enter the bill number into that box, and it takes you to what's called the bill page. Um, and I'll share bill numbers in just a moment. On that page is 
uh, what's called the bill analysis. There are two, there are, well, three things that can help you learn more directly. This is going to the source. Um, the file copy on the bill is the actual bill language itself. That's legislative language. So to, uh, to Representative Devlin's point, the bill analysis, which is written attorneys, and they break that down into more plain language so that we all can, who are non-lawyers, can read it and understand. And there are bill summaries and bill analyses on each of the bill pages. There's also on the bill page what's called a JF report. Um, just so that you know, those are written by the clerks of the various committees. So some of them are better than others. They're not written by attorneys. They're summaries of testimony and information. So I would recommend folks, you know, go there directly. But I also recommend that people, you know, if you're on one side of the issue to listen to what the other side says and, and go to the various websites of the different groups who are involved. So a couple of bills. Um, Madam First Selectwoman, you mentioned 6611, which um, just to go back for a minute to what Rep Devlin said, you know, in committee, we hear bill ideas from individual residents, from advocacy groups, from fellow legislators, and in our committee in planning and development, and, you know, Senator Wong, is, he's heard me say this a whole bunch of times because I shared this in committee. We had a number of bills that came to us through and recommended to us through various organizations who have worked together. Um, so one bill that we have, 6611, was a group called Open Communities Alliance was the main proponent. It was, and in the legislature, the majority leader of the House is the main proponent. That bill was referred to the Judiciary Committee and heard or on the agenda for the committee on Monday. And the bill was what's called held, which means the bill died in committee. Um, so you may have read some news reports that say, well, you know, it can be resurrected in other vehicles, so to speak. I want to just clarify that because a lot of people have been talking about um, dummy bills and other vehicles. And rep I, see, I'm calling, I was going to call you Representative Kupchik. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> Madam First Elect. Senator Wong does that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but our first elect woman knows, and as the rest of the delegation, um, I had a bill yesterday about birth certificates, and we had what was called a strike all amendment, which was germane to the bill, which means it was relevant to the bill itself. So my the fair share proposal um, has a lot of questions, a lot of concerns. I've talked to some of you. Um, Mr. Wagner was good enough to spend time talking with me, other TP or excuse me, other TP and Z members as well. And that bill um, would essentially a number uh, close to the number that Rep. Weaver talked about a regional fair share number of housing units that each region would have to create and then broken down by town. Now, again, the bill has died in the Judiciary Committee. Um, I can tell you as the chair of the Planning and Development Committee, which is where the bill originated, it's not an expectation that that bill will somehow magically resurrect itself. Um, so that's 6611. If you want, I can go on if I may. Is that okay? Uh, well, if, I, if I may. Benna, let me jump in a little and Laura, go ahead. So I just wanted to jump in and Chris and I appreciate what you said, but at least what's reported in the press because that bill was from the majority leader in the house and he has stated it's not over. So um, you know how things work in the legislature, things can creep in anywhere, but uh, it sounded to me like he was committed to keeping that policy moving forward. Well, I can say that the bill as it is currently written is not going to move forward in that form. If I, if I may, uh, I, I think it's important to have the matrix that was suggested, and I, I we will provide that information uh, in a contrast with the various activist organizations uh, and, and let people make the determination. But I, I do want to reiterate that it is important to note that no bill is dead in the General Assembly till the end of session. And the idea that bills that have been rejected or amended by the legislative process could be resurrected and implemented in dummy bills is very real. 
Uh, I believe the House just implemented a strike all bill on telehealth that is relate that that was placed into a totally unrelated bill that was supposed to be a study that became a comprehensive telehealth bill that that we all supported. But nevertheless, the resurrection of, of concepts and ideas that have existed through four different committees from transportation to housing to finance to the housing, uh, the planning and development committee. All of it is very real. The other important concept because of the significant uh, Democratic majority in both chambers of the Senate and the House, I do believe if people in our community and, and local leaders are, are deeply impacted or opposed to these policies, that they clearly let our your legislators know because the reality is you are fortunate to have the chair of planning and development uh, and for myself as the ranking senate member we will be on the forefront of these issues we need to hear from you and it is not just simply enough to say oops the bill is up for a vote and we're going to vote for it but we're not going to vote for it we're going to vote no because we're going to listen to our community you have leaders that, that are at the forefront of these issues. And even if you vote no, the bill by the simple majority becomes effective. The towns and its residents are going to have to live with the results. So if there's nothing else I ask of our legislators and for residents and town leaders, we need to implore our legislative leaders not just simply to say no on the vote, it can't come up for a vote, but the collaboration needs to be, look, we all agree there's a critical need for housing everywhere in the state. It's not just our suburbs. It includes our cities, includes our rural setting. And the only way we can create <clears throat> solutions is to have a collaborative effort with neighborhoods, with local government, with leaders that have demonstrated incredible vision already and state and federal leaders. That is the only way we can do it. So I would say, let's go back to the drawing board, really work hard through this summer and this updated legislative session to get all parties and all shareholders involved and create a plan that is a true collaborative effort, not an agenda driven by specific interest groups with good intentions, with all due respect, but to incorporate feedback. So my offer and my suggestion to our legislative leaders in this is these bills cannot be called because if it does even if you vote no it's going to pass and when it gets called and it gets passed and it irreparably changes our community our towns and our neighborhoods there should be an accountability there so um so, so, so let me just jump let me just jump in a second um all right, so we could debate these bills all day long. And, and, and I just wanna say as a nine year legislator, um, that is 100% true. Bills are stripped clean and new language is thrown in and voted on like that. It happens, we all know it happens. So let's just be clear on that. What, what, I'm, what I'm trying to think of as a former legislator who served on the housing committee and, and, and tried to amend 8-30G, which has been extraordinarily detrimental to our community. It has not, give, it has not given um, or attributed to an increased amount of affordable housing in any measurable way. It is the, it is, it is the tail wagging the dog. And we, we just, every time 100 or 200 units go up, a small amount of housing goes in, and we are now have even higher amount of of a part of residents. Now our rate has to go up. It just it, it's it's a never ending cycle. You never get there. And let's be clear. I mean, the medium area income that's not true affordable housing um, for a lot of these uh, places. And we're not really making a dent in the in the effort to build more affordable units when we, when we have to have so many more market rate units added to our town. Um, so I, I've always been against that and because I thought the whole bill should be scrapped and we should start over. So what my question is, this a leader of this town who listens to everybody in all the districts, is 
when we are trying so hard as a town to just even get to the point where we can reach a moratorium, and Mark uh, went over an overview of, of all of this work that we're doing to try to achieve this. Why is there any bill in the legislature, any bill trying to mandate more things on towns when towns ha can't even get a chance to get their affordable housing plans up and, and start working them. We're, we're not even having a chance to reach the goal of the current legislation. So a as a leader of this town, and, and we have a lot of members on, on, on here who want to hear why, why are there any bills being proposed on these zones? Why? So if I may jump in to let's okay. talk about the bills themselves and planning and development, since that's really what so much of the angst and frustration and concern and excitement and a lot of, you know, a lot of different emotions across the spectrum that people have. But I'd like to talk about 830G. As you know, having served on the Housing Committee with Senator Wong, that is generally the purview of the Housing Committee. So the bills that we are talking about in planning and development relate to 8-2. 8-2 is what I would say the umbrella under which land use, all land use, affordable housing, commercial development, um, residential real estate, all of it is falls under that statute. And in fact, if we passed none of the bills related to 8-2, or if we passed all of them, 830G would still be in effect. So Correct. the conversation about 830G is an important one. And I think it's something that, you know, I've said many times before, it's a blunt instrument. And, you know, some people would argue that there has been some affordable housing development in our state as a result. And others like those of us in Fairfield who have been um, you know, addressing this issue for years, understand the difficulty and the struggle with what 830G has been done because primarily the, the hand uh, is to the developer. The fair share plan, which again, I, I hear you, yes, bills can reappear. I'm saying to you as the chair of the Planning and Development Committee, I have no expectation sitting here today that 6611, as it's written in its current form, is somehow going to magically reappear. I understand that you can doubt what I'm saying and all that. Uh, the point that I'm wanting to make about fair share is that the idea was to put the power and the, the control in the town's hands in terms of coming up with a, the plan and working towards. You can't force a developer to develop, right? You, But you are... Um, asking the town to do that. But again, I'd rather talk for a minute about a couple of the other bills that we have in committees. And I want to talk about bringing shareholders to the table and open public process. 6107 is one of the House bills that has been in the House for three years. It's gone through three years of public hearings. Two years ago, we passed it out of the House with bipartisan support from members of the delegation um, in Fairfield House members. And last year, that bill passed out of the Planning and Development Committee. It does a few things. It reorganizes the zoning statute so that it makes it a little bit more clear and accessible for our volunteer commissioners, as well as legally speaking. It removes the use of the word character. It doesn't remove the use of specific terms like historic, site plant or site uh, setbacks, soil, height, density, et cetera. Those things are there in terms of um, the specifics, but that bill would remove the word character. It would require that communities affirmatively further federal fair housing, and it would create a working group. I talked about the affordable um, plan, housing plan requirements that's now in place under what's 830J of the statute. And that working group would be charged with helping communities figure out how they would be in compliance. Because right now we just say, hey, come up with an affordable housing plan and Fairfield does a great job, but a new community doing it for the first time might not know exactly what's in there. So that group would come up with how communities would actually be in compliance. So that's 6107. There are two bills in the Senate. 1026 is a bill. That Representative McCarthy Vahey, if, if I may add, if I may add as a follow-up, as the ranking member on the committee, it's important to note that 6107 was indeed voted on this year. 
And as you articulated, that similar bill to this was raised in the past years. But it is important to note why these kind of meetings are important, because that bill raised in the past few years did not have the level of dialogue, the level of engagement, the level of transparency, of real input from shareholders. Oh. So as a result, it's important to note, you can refer back, but this year in committee, after nearly over 24 hours mm -hmm. of public hearing input and nearly 70% uh, of people still not getting a chance to view or voice their concerns, the vote of 6107 in committee this year was 17 to nine. So there was a real concern in regards to the removal of the word character and the convening of a working group that does not incorporate any local leadership in regards to some of the formulation of enabled zoning. But it also based a premise that enabled zoning powers come from the state and they grant that to our local municipalities. That is the premise of 6107. Look, we worked on many other components. It is important to talk about why it's so important and powerful to have these kind of dialogues, to have the sense of transparency that is needed in, in the current debate right now. Not having this conversation would impose laws and impact our community that befalls our residents and say, what the heck just happened? I think this opportunity oh, to raise out the contrast that you just pointed out, where this year the vote was 17 to nine, and there was yep, over thousands of people that wanted to articulate their viewpoint. So again, yeah. these kind of conversations so, are necessary, but you can't based on what happened in the past, because ultimately you can look back to the tapes on that, that conversation of comparable bills lasted 15 minutes of debate in the committee, not the 24 hour you had this year, when greater transparency and awareness was being uh, promoted. <coughs> so, uh, again, I, I wanted to clarify that because uh, we can point to past this years, is, but ultimately this year, it's important that people that. are engaged. It's, and it's important for me to point out that the reason it was in the committee for the third year in a row was after two years of a fair housing public working group process, that was open to the public. And you're right, there is more of a highlight. I think this really goes back to the first question that we had. This year, there were a number of other proposals. And I would you know, say that the, the other bill that has 8-2 um, elements, or a lot of 8-2 elements, which is the 1024 bill. But to your point, Senator Wong, you're absolutely right. We have had more engagement involvement because of the online format and, and the ability for people to engage that way, which yes, I, I think we all would have liked to have been able to sit. It would have been literally at least uh, who were there. But I think I'd like to also just say there are two other bills in the Senate 1026 and 1024. 1026 would require training of our zoning commissioners. And 1024 um, also is a lot of 8-2 pieces, but it does a number of other things. And I'm, I'm happy to talk more about that. Um, Senator Wong is as well, I'm sure. Um, but I, I see, Madam First Select Woman, you are looking to jump in, so I'll stop. So no, I, I think this has been a good dialogue and I, I think it's informative for everyone on. I hope it is anyway. Um, I do want to just uh, kind of swing back a little and, and loop in um, our planning and zoning director, uh, Jim Went, and our uh, chairperson, uh, Matt Wagner. And I just want to, listen, they, they deal with this all day long. Um, they deal with this uh, applications. And f I'm going to go back to what I said. I don't know why there's any zoning bills being proposed when the 8-30G bill needs modification. It needs it. We see it every day, every single day here in town. And it could have been, believe me, I, I worked on this for nine years with Tony. It could have been modified in a way that would actually allow us to have the chance to build more affordable housing without all this predatory development. It, it really could have. 
and we missed a lot of chances uh, over the last nine years and because we, we didn't have the votes. But I want to ask our two planning and zoning local people. I mean, you want to speak a little bit about how we're trying to comply with these 8-30G bills? And, and do you honestly think we need any additional zoning bills coming at us in the town of Fairfield um, that would be beneficial to our community? So uh, thanks very much. And thank you to um, all my fellow panelists for the spirited debate and information. Um, it's very much appreciated. So um, uh, 830G has, uh, we, we've seen some pretty uh, remarkable effects of, of the statute in our town. Um, large uh, uh, developments on, on parcels of land that were not intended to be developed in that fashion. Um, the biggest problem to me with the statute is that in, in 40 years, those are simply going to be um, market rate apartment buildings. Uh, they're no longer going to be uh, affordable housing. Um, you know, the premise for much of the, um, uh, uh, the activity that we've seen in the legislature uh, it has been uh, to um, help those who have been disenfranchised over the last generations. A, a, a remarkable agenda, which I support uh, supporting uh, those who, who have uh, been disenfranchised over the years. Um, but uh, these bills do not have that effect. Um, designing affordable housing, uh, dense density for density's sake, uh, to provide an opportunity for uh, those who've been disenfranchised to simply rent apartments uh, 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 in places where they would like to live um, doesn't help them in the long run to develop equity in real property uh, and um, use that to their advantage and build intergenerational wealth. Um, so to that end, uh, these these bills are, are misguided. Um, what What would help in that regard is uh, uh, subsidies and um, uh, uh, banking uh, reform to provide opportunities for those who've been disenfranchised over the generations to actually purchase land and, and homes and, and build equity uh, the way that uh, I have heard talked about. Um, so uh, the fair share, I mean, I don't know whether you want me to talk about the individual bills or come back to 830G, but the fair well, share I just, bills. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, how do you think, I mean, both, I want Jim to jump in too. I mean, how do you think these are going to impact us in our well, town? Well, the fair share bill um, is, is, is simply untenable. Uh, in its first iteration, the calculations required that we build 4,300 uh, new affordable units. We only have 22,000 housing units in town. I mean, it was about 20 to 25 percent. Uh, it was amended and the new calculations would would have required 2,300. Then it would require the town to identify the specific parcels which would be developed to meet, to achieve that uh, goal. And it placed the burden on the town to develop a plan that articulated a, quote, reasonable opportunity for those dwelling for those uh, parcels to be developed uh, and and for them to be uh, you know uh, deemed affordable um, it, it, it's entirely unworkable uh, it created a, a a private right of action for an aggrieved party to then file a lawsuit against the town in the superior court in in Hartford uh, it's the, it created a jurisdiction for those um, those lawsuits in Hartford and it, it, that would provide an opera, a vehicle for an aggrieved party to challenge the plan that put, put you know that the town put forth. Um, by the same token, in order for the town to establish that it had met the burden, the town would have to file suit for declaratory judgment in that same court in in Hartford, and for a judge to sit uh, in judgment of another municipality's um, uh, uh, plan. Um, and so, all of the resources devoted to trying to achieve this sort of vague and ambiguous goal of a reasonable opportunity to, uh, 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 to, to uh, achieve the build out of specific parcels that, by the way, are private land. You know, the town doesn't own land that can be developed into 2300. We're not developers. Um, and so uh, all of that would, in my opinion, 
uh, be a wasted effort, result in, in years upon years of litigation, costing the town and, and individuals incredible amounts of money, all to an end which we really don't understand. Okay, so I, I am extremely opposed to that bill and to that um, uh, that calculus uh, and that um, and that agenda uh, uh, I I extremely. Um, I would agree with you that the um, uh, what's been the 10, 10 24, uh has largely been um, remediated. Look, the, so the, town of, the, the town of Fairfield uh, largely complies with most of the requirements of that bills today of that bill today. Um, you know, as uh, Mr. Barnhart, um, uh, I thought did a, did a nice job of summarizing the Matt work Wagner that we've done so over over the years. Can everybody um, mute their phones if they're not speaking? Thank you. That um, we've we've done uh, uh, such a a really great job, if I may, Pat, our uh, local delegation on the back of um, uh, uh, of promoting the development of affordable housing in so many different ways. Uh, most recently through the ADU regulations, but we've created the overlays, the inclusive zoning. We, we created the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Um, as Mr. Barnhart said, we were one of the, uh, maybe the first, not the first, one of the first towns to actually have an affordable housing plan in place. And we are doing the hard work. And that is why it is, it is so offensive for um, those uh, at the state level to dictate to all towns, uh, this sort of, as you've characterized, one one size fits all. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, yes, I, I can sit here and say, I've reviewed the bills, I've reviewed 1024. We largely comply with all those requirements, but to that end, you know, it's unnecessary. Um, I agree with the bill requiring, um, uh, I agree with the concept of the bill requiring uh, an educational component for uh, commissioners on uh, town plan and zoning bodies. Look, we are a quasi-judicial body. We have real impact on the lives and the, the dollars of, of our citizens and the people that we represent. Uh, when we make decisions about land use, it impacts people's families and their pocketbooks and their investments and so forth. Um, you know, we hear and receive evidence and witnesses, cross-examination and the like. Uh, and so it is really important that we that we get it as right as we can. And when you have lay people on uh, these uh, bodies um, that don't understand the process, that don't understand the law, don't understand how case law impacts our decisions, don't understand the appellate process and the judicial process of how things get appealed and um, even how to put in their evidence, uh, you have, uh, you know, um, so, so I, I think it's important that there be a component of, of education uh, for commissioners, uh, but it needs to be tweaked. I'm a lawyer. I'm already subject to continuing legal education. I've been doing this for, I've been on the commission for over 10 years. I've been chair for, I don't even know, uh, six or seven years. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm already sitting in classes and having my credits and to some degree, that involves land use. Um, I'm, I'm not opposed to a refresher or, or recertification, but there should be some baseline of, uh, of qualification uh, for folks to sit on a zoning board. So I, I'm generally agree in agreement with that. Um, so I, I'll kind of stop there. I, I, you know, I think I touched on on the biggies. Um, you know, but. We're almost there. Uh, if everything that we uh, have approved uh, is built, we will uh, have enough points under 830G to achieve a moratorium. Um, I do think that uh, 830G um, has had uh, incredibly unintended consequences, um, especially for municipalities like Fairfield, uh, where uh, there is um, you know limited amount of um, developable developable land um, where we have some densely populated areas around the um, transit oriented districts and the like. Um, and, and I think when you look at the complex, uh, the, the, the complexion of the, the rest of the, the state, um, that 830G um, could have uh, 
good consequences where there is land that can be developed um, uh, and um, where developers can get a reprieve from, from local zoning restrictions where those might not make a whole lot of sense. Um, uh, so um, that's my two cents on the issues we've been talking about. Thank you, Matt. Um, Jim, do you want to uh, jump in at all and, and offer any perspective? Sure, I'll, 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 I, I'm not, I, I don't have anything to add uh, to what Mr. Wagner already articulated with respect to the, to the pending bills. I just want to go back and put a little order of magnitude on um, the number of dwelling units we're talking about. And when, when Mark discussed earlier the progress uh, we're making towards a moratorium and what we've seen in, in developments with respect to 8-30G applications in particular in Fairfield, um, there have been 13, I'm not in, well, thir 13 developments that have been authorized totaling 477 total units. Um, with 214 of those being affordable units. Of those projects, about roughly half of those uh, are complete in terms of number of projects. 168 total dwelling units constructed with 110 of those being af affordable units. So we, we are creating a, a number of units. And then with respect to the inclusionary zoning provision that was adopted um, in 2015, there's been seven developments totaling 892 dwelling units, 91 of those uh, affordable. Of those projects, 367 units are completed or nearly complete with 38 of those affordable. So that's for, for a community of our size with the number of dwelling units that we have, that, that's a lot of dwelling unit production in a fairly compressed period of time. Um, so we are approaching, and, and there are some uh, approvals that haven't been implemented yet that would put us over uh, the count to allow us to achieve moratorium status. Um, um, so I just wanted to kind of put the number of units out there, but yet it's true that until those units are built and occupied, uh, we can't make that application for moratorium. And so there are additional applications lined up in the queue um, for uh, consideration. So it is, um, sure. it is, that's really all I have at this point. Thank you, Jim, that is helpful. So um, I, I do want us to continue the dialogue on some of these bills, but I, I'm just gonna go back and say that I, uh, you know, listen, I, I served in the legislature with you guys. Um, I, I know the deal. And when bills would come up or language would change, I would be running back to the caucus room or even outside of the hall of the house. And I would be on the phone with the chief of police, you know, or and say, hey, you know, here's a bill, you know, that just changed the language. What do you think? Or I'd be on the phone with Mark Barnhart um, as a legislator, or I'd be on, I'd call the fire chief because, you know, it's important that I think, I think what our community wants is our legislators to remember that, you know, you, to check in here with us, you know, me, with Mark, with Jim, um, with, with, with any of our uh, people who are, who, are, who are dealing with this day in and day out before we sign off on any legislation because, you know, this stuff is having a serious impact on our town. I, I mean, a real impact. And, it's, and, and I think what's happened here is gotten into this um, discussion about uh, people who care about affordable housing and people who don't. And I don't think that's the discussion. Because yeah, I think yeah. we all want people to live and have an ability to live in affordable housing. But when predatory developers completely take over um, charge of, of well-intended legislation, um, that's the real consequence. And we've seen it. We've all seen it up close and personal. So I think, um, I think that's the ask from me. <laughs> and I would think that's the ask from our entire community is, you know, I, listen, I know what it can be like to be up there and it's crazy and things are happening and legislation is flying around. But, you know, I, I'm going to go back and say I except for the training and I think the language needs to be reviewed very closely before they votes on it because you might have to somebody end up taking a lot of um, training. But I, I agree training is important, but I, I just don't see how our town can take another mandate on zoning uh, changes. I just you know, don't see how we can. If I could jump in and just 
um, adding to what you were saying about sort of how things work in Hartford and why it is so important that you're hosting this forum tonight and there are so many people that are listening and engaged and I hope this is available to our community afterwards. There is a lot of stuff flying around in the legislature and a lot of it is not good. And the reality is we're going to be in session. The House is going in session tomorrow at 1030. I don't even have a go list yet. We don't even know what we're voting on. So to your point that things are going to come up, they're going to get called, you know, uh, and we may see new language for the first time. We may need to reach out. And that's why there are rallies happening around when there are important issues. We did this with tolls. Right. You've got to get the attention of people outside the gold dome because everybody's busy living their lives. They're going to work. They're taking care of their kids. They're doing whatever else you do in normal life and not paying attention to what's happening out of Hartford. And it's really difficult to get news from Hartford out into our community. So um, I again, thank you for doing this. But um, yeah, stay stay aware. Um, the CGA website is good. Reach out to any of us along the way, and we will certainly be sharing as you know important issues continue to come up. But it happens fast. So, so I'm going to put the onus on the legislators here. You know, um, I know I used to say it too. You know, reach out to me and let me know how you think. But actually, I'm going to put it on all of you. You got to reach out to us and let us know what is happening and ask our opinion before you cast a vote on anything that's going to put um, our town in a tough position. So, Madam First Select Woman. Tony, I'm, you're on I'm, mute. I'm hearing, I'm hearing that my connection. I feel like Senator Cassano oh, planning and first. development. No, I, I, I appreciate that, Brenda. And I, I appreciate that your perspective as a legislator and as a town leader is important and, and ultimately we want to hear from all of you because the premise for us is we are your representatives. We should represent your voice. And if we don't engage and represent your voice, you need to know that. So ultimately, we want to hear from you. Um, and, 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 and that's part of the process. Transparency, accountability, and, and visibility is important. But I, I, this is such an important meeting, uh, Madam First Select Woman. It's, uh, it's important, and, and I, I will leave on this note, that we are so fortunate in the town of Fairfield to have the Affordable Housing Task Force, advocates that are involved in the community. And one thing we didn't even get to were significant concerns in regards for us as a coastal community and the environmental impact in regards to watershed protection, as well as the increased capacity in sewer and alternative septic treatment systems that will have a dramatic impact to facilitate increased density. Look, there is a cause and effect in many of these policy implementations. We don't sit in a vacuum and we need to be very conscious. The environmental concerns are extremely uh, important to me as well. And, and I don't think we've done enough to, to do justice to what increased density has facilitated yeah. or could potentially cause. So, we need to hear from woman? everyone. So I listen. I want to so, give everybody. I, I, I want to give everybody a chance to to talk. And uh, 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 Laura, and Kristen, to and Tony, Jennifer, you haven't really. <laughs> they've kind of over over. Uh, well, I think there's, talked there's a little. Maybe you want to jump in a little, Jen, and talk about what you might think about some of this stuff. I think Kristen was saying something, but I'm happy to speak after that. Okay. Um, Madam First Select Woman, if I if I could just respond, I think you know just in this conversation, you're getting a flavor of some of the intensity around this conversation. So you, you know, I've heard now from at least two folks on this call that, you know, why should we do anything now? We need to be able to properly plan for our future. There are tools within some of these proposals that will help our communities properly plan for our future. I will give an example. Uh, Mr. Wagner referenced case law. The, the, the ability to have our inclusionary zone here in Fairfield, that's from case law. Uh, one of the bills actually proposes codifying that into statute so that communities are clear and the zoning enabling statute has clear language and makes explicit to communities not like Fairfield who knows 
but that those that those are in there. In terms of environmental concerns, some of the proposals actually further specify and clarify the need to consider the impact of proposed developments on the Long Island Sound. And it gets more specific about the language and what needs to be considered. It also includes the navigable waterways that feed into those uh, into the sound. So there's actually additional language there that does that. Um, there's language in uh, one of the 8-2 sections that expands the energy and water conservation tools. That now, those are some of the things it does. The, there's, there's a proposal that would allow towns to decide to write regulations to be able to have technical fees for technical consultants who, if you have a developer coming in and you have a neighborhood group and if the commission decides they want to have their own neutral opinion, that, and again, that would be up to the communities. Um, there's another tool that would allow communities, again, this is permissive, it's not required, to use a vehicle miles traveled as opposed to level of service for traffic determinations and for figuring out what kinds of things we want to ask the bus stops or bike racks or things like that. Um, and I think the other thing that uh, specifically 1024 provides is a model code working group, which if a community chose to adopt, they could do so, but they would not have to then create them on their own. 169 communities would not have to create model form-based codes. That working group would do so, and then a, community, a municipality and a community would have the opportunity to adopt them on their own. I think it's really important for us to focus in, and I really, you know, I again appreciate the time Mr. Wagner spent with me. Um, I know our planning uh, office folks have been very generous as well. Um, and I welcome the opportunity to talk individually with any member of the delegation. I encourage it. And with uh, you, Madam First Selectwoman, I'm interested in looking at the specific pieces of the proposal and how we can address those concerns that people have. Um, I will say, you know, I, I go back to what Rep Devlin said about parking. This is one area that I think we have had conversation about, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the, the, just to be clear, the parking requirements that are in uh, 1024 are related to dwelling units, not to um, like the library where I think everyone does look for more parking and hopefully we can get more people there. But Specifically, I think it's good and helpful to look at what those different aspects of the bill are, and I will continue to remain in conversation about those. Jen, did you want to have, you haven't had much of a chance. <laughs> you I, want to jump in. I, I just want to say that I agree wholeheartedly with you that we need to be engaging in conversation with our community. And I have been doing that since the day after the election. I've been talking with neighbors. I've been talking with um, other people here on this forum who work in town hall. I had about a month ago, my own zoning forum where we went through the details of many of these bills and um, actually shared many opinions that uh, Mr. Wagner just shared. And I think it's really helpful if we could be speaking in details about these bills because we all know how Fairfield's been impacted by 830G and how wildly unpopular it is in our community. And we really have been a community particularly and dispor disproportionately hard hit by that um, legislation. And that those feelings are clearly and understandably spilling over into this conversation as well. And to your point, um, Madam First Select Woman, like how could we possibly be talking about anything else in regards to zoning with that still out there? And, and the approach that I've had is for nearly a decade, you guys fought tooth and nail to try to get 830G amended or repealed. And that didn't happen. There weren't the votes. So I have viewed this process, this session, 
as our opportunity to go through what could be a viable replacement, because I don't think we're going to get rid of 830G without a viable replacement. Now, I don't want anyone to think that I think we have before us the viable replacement, but I do think that this is the process where all the stakeholders come together and try to figure out what could be the viable replacement? And I don't think fair share is it, as I shared in my form about a month ago, but there are elements there that I think are intriguing. Instead of putting the burden on the private sector and the developers, it puts it a little bit more on the town where we would get to choose our sites. And as Mr. Wagner said, we've done a really good job of creating overlay zones. We already have B and C zones that allow as of right multifamily housing. We could be, potentially finding ways to drive development there. 6611, fair share doesn't do that yet, but I hope we can continue the conversation. And I also just wanna be really clear that all of the proposals before us have taken out the proposed as of right components and that the committee process was successful. It heard the, it heard the voices of Connecticut residents and Fairfield residents and it removed that component, particularly in 1024, where I think there was a, the greatest concern through the committee process anyways. Um, and so that I hope we can continue to have this conversation and not kick the conversation down the road by saying no to everything and we are going to stop this conversation. That doesn't mean we are going to vote for it necessarily at the end of the day, but I think we need to continue to have a detailed and specific conversation about what parts are not a right fit for Fairfield and why and how can we get to a place where we are enacting legislation that would be a right fit for Fairfield and for the rest of Connecticut so that we are no longer disproportionately shouldering the burden of, of affordable housing. Thank you, Jen. So um, I would say to the delegation, you know, um, all of us are having to submit affordable housing plans, right, to the state. I mean, isn't that a fair argument for, for all of you to make to the majority to the speaker, hey, listen, why don't we give towns a chance to send in their affordable housing plans? You know, let's see how they're doing before we're going to move forward with, and as Jen said, you know, there's some parts that may be good, but why don't we at least give ch towns a chance to put put that, put those plans on the table and then review them with, a, with whatever group, uh, Kristen, you were speaking about a working group before we were to make, um, because as we know, you know, when you make once a bill is it passed and it's in law, it's it's almost impossible to get it to, to stop you know, it. Can I can I jump in on that one? If yes. I may be again excused for a few minutes, uh, we're, we're in a debate on an issue, and I'll I'll come right back. Sorry about that. That's okay. Thanks, Tony. You're doing doing your job there. That's that's what that's the first thing. So, uh, Madam First Select Woman, I think. Part of what's happened in the conversation around these bills is 830G and 8-2 have been conflated. And there are many pieces in the 8-2 reorganization and even some of the additions that are not going to be related to a town's affordable housing um, uh, plan. So I think there's, again, there are many people who feel like, well, we shouldn't do anything else until we fix 830G. And I would suggest, as you know well, the ability to make amendments to that statute when we did make the changes, which I did support and voted for and helped to override the governor's veto. Yep. Uh, there was an agreement among legislators at the time to not to, to leave that be for a while. Whether there was an agreement or not, the fact remains that that is a broader conversation that absolutely I think should happen. But that does not preclude us from doing some of the things, some of the basic things in, in 6107 in particular, which are to reorganize the zoning statute. That's not about advantaging developers or about advantaging people who want to make money. This is about helping to plan for our future. And I think one thing that's really important that every one of us has said is we know that we need to plan for our future. We know that we are going to need to have places where people live. And I also am very much listening, not just to my constituents, people around the state, but definitely to my constituents. And there are plenty of folks who I've heard from who are begging for more diversity of housing stock. 
And we've got market forces that that's part of what's happening here, 830G or not. Um, we are seeing people paying rent for two bedroom apartments in Fairfield far exceed the mortgage I pay on my single family home. Um, and that's because they want to live here because this is such a great community. Um, but when we look at that 8-2, eight, eight those 8-2 pieces, um, we haven't talked a lot about accessory dwelling units. And I just give a lot of credit to our town for coming up with regulations. And indeed there is, there's not an exact match. You know, the 1024 language goes a little bit farther in some ways and actually doesn't go as far in other ways, which is interesting, right? Because in some ways we're ahead, our town is ahead of what that statute suggests, but in others, um, it was, it, you know, we've, Matt, I see Matt, I can actually see you on my screen. Do you want to jump into that? Because I'd love to talk about some of the substance. I, 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 I'm, I'm kind of holding, biting my, my tongue on in so many places, but, but right there, I just, I have to react to something you just said about how um, 1024 has provisions for ADUs that are slightly different, right, than how we have decided to do it. In some ways goes a little bit further, but in other ways, not as far. We spent a lot of time developing our ADU regulations, and we as a community decided to enact what we believed work, will work for our town. And the point, I think, of this entire exercise is to communicate to you and others in Hartford that that is the role of the municipality and local home rule to enact regulations that provide for the opportunities for these kinds of dwelling units on terms that the community believes will work for it and the way that the community would like to see its land developed and its de dwelling units developed. And it's not the same as another community in upstate Connecticut might decide that they wanna see that happen. And so rather than dictate the regulations around which communities must have ADU regulations, there should be a requirement that there be ADU regulations. Um, it's proscriptive. Uh, and that I think is the general objection, right? And so if 10, it's my understanding that if those provisions of 1024 pass, we, we would comply in material respects, but there would also be some aspects that we would have to change. And quite frankly, given the success that we've seen over the years in that regard, that's the flavor you're getting. It's not appropriate, right? That's why we object. And I think what Matt is saying is um, we don't want so to I be think, dictated by think, think about it this way in our own community. Yeah. Think, think about it this way. Think, think about it more in terms of the Limited Liabilities Company Act. Um, so we, we have, as a state law, uh, uh, model rules or mo a model operating agreement that um, uh, is, is uh, in place as a default mechanism when you organize a limited liability company. Now, it's a baseline. You can choose to adopt your own uh, uh, operating agreement for your limited liability company, but if you don't, then these baseline rules apply. You don't even have to have all of them in your operating agreement. But if you're just if you just flat out don't have one, then those are the rules that apply. Um, you know, I can understand there being a requirement that each town have an affordable housing plan. We comply with that, but don't tell us exactly what you think we need to have in our affordable housing plan. Well, none of the bills currently have that contemplated and the 830J provision was voted into law previously. But just let's just talking about the ADUs for a moment. And, and by the way, I think that that was a really a wonderful conversation that happened here in Fairfield. But specifically here are a couple of things that the state proposal or one of the bill's proposals talks about something that happens in communities around the state, which is a requirement that only those who are related to you can live in accessory dwelling unit, for example. So that would be one of the changes. Here in Fairfield, some folks are able to have a detached accessory dwelling unit, but not all folks are. So I talked earlier 
you know, in terms of those individual property rights and what's looser or more strict, right? And and I I have to say again, I respect the process that the um, committee, the TPNZ went through. But in some places in our town, if you have a larger lot, you're able to have that detached dwelling unit. Whereas in some places in town, with the smaller lots. You're, you're not able to, but I, but Mr. Wagner, I don't disagree I, with the fact that you're saying, yes, there would be changes. There are two, I think specifically two places in the proposals as they stand today, where uh, the accessory dwelling units and the parking pieces that are more prescriptive, I would suggest the, the I think the, the other pieces for the most part of the bill, um, are not prescriptive in the same way. I think there are, although there are things, some other kind of the nitty gritty, as I say, that would require a zoning enforcement officials to be certified, that would ask the water pollution control authorities to include in their, in their plan um, forward thinking about where there might be multifamily development or density of development uh, down the road for a community. Those are, you know, planning um, planning features. So there are a lot of different pieces to it. Yeah. The, the other point I'd like to, to make expressly um, is that, uh, and this really goes in response to um, uh, Representative Leeper's um, comments. These bills are not designed to be a replacement for 830G. That's not my understanding. 830G is not going away. Okay anytime soon. So even if these uh, were passed and, and put into motion, um, it is not my understanding that we would be relieved from any obligations under 830. And that's and why I, did, I did want to also comment you, you uh, to Chris that, Mitch, talking about, um, you know, our, our vote on amending um, and the work that uh, you know, Tony and I did on the housing committee, but that's a sunset. That, that bill, the, those changes are sunsetting which means all that hard work overriding the veto by Governor Malloy. And that thing is sunsetting, when? five year sunset. So, you know, being able to count our seniors, which, you know, count as a half a point in the prior and now get to count as a full point under the work we did if it's tied to a family, um, a family dwelling, that goes away. So it goes, it reverts right back. Um, and I think, I think absolutely. And I, I do want to take a, a moment point that 8 30 G. Now, listen, I don't know if somebody, uh, if Representative Leeper heard somebody say that, um, you know, if we pass some of these bills, magically they're going to repeal 8 30 G. I don't know, but I, I fought pretty hard for nine years. I don't think anybody's touching that. So uh, can I just have, I'll happily respond to that. So part of my job is to also advocate for the change I want to see, right? And so I don't think that I could support these legislations without that. And I don't think that's necessarily gonna happen this session, but having this conversation so that we can actually meaningfully tackle 830G with proposed solutions is for me what a part of this conversation is for. I in no way meant to imply that these were some sort of magical replacement, but I think this is the conversation about tactical policy proposals that could be an effective and viable replacement for 830G down the road. And knowing and, that and, sunset and, is approaching, we might have a unique window to re-engage in exactly that conversation. And I appreciate that, Representative Leeper, and perhaps uh, you, myself, and Rep, uh, for select woman, Cupcheck, I did call you Rep again, <laughs> should talk about our experience. If you truly are looking to make changes in A30G, you're talking to two individuals right now that were on the forefront in a bipartisan basis with the co-chairs of, of uh, uh, Democratic Senator, uh, former uh, Slossberg and uh, uh, House member Larry Butler. We did it and we had the experience. So if you truly wanted to do something in that, you have two individuals that went through the battle and battle scars to show for it. We'd be happy to do that. But ultimately to answer Matt's question, all of these proposals on Senate Bill Fair Share 6611, Senate Bill 1024, and House Bill 6107. All of these proposed changes will be possibly in place in addition 
to the existing requirements of 830G. So it is clear to answer, we're not touching 830G and the burden on our municipalities and the leaders that have demonstrated tremendous vision, tremendous initiative, and it doesn't just go back to present. People need to understand 830G does not account for housing that was built pre-1990. We have Sullivan McKinney, we have Parish Court. These were incredible initiatives that Operation Hope was one of the first privately funded homeless shelter in Connecticut. Those issues don't get raised. And I'd be remiss if I didn't address some of the potential attacks and challenges of community and intent. Look, as a racial minority and an immigrant who loves this country, opportunity in housing is critical. To, to assign the motive that Fairfield does not do enough in its exclusionary practices and to have a tone of not doing right by social equality is a false premise. It is a, 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 an idea that puts the conversation aside to not and ignore the incredible efforts that have been undertaken in the history of this town and currently. So I, I want to put that out from the standpoint that as a racial minority who lived in a federal housing project that understands that housing is a critical, essential building block for anyone pursuing the American dream, I will always be supportive of solutions that incorporate viable, sustainable solutions that addresses the problem, not a top-down, one-size-fits-all. So I am very eager to work in a collaborative manner with all the advocates that, that may think that I'm the devil on one side of the debate. So I am more than happy to go to work to find that we have an issue we need to address, but incorporate in an earnest and genuine opportunity for all shareholders with disparate and disagreeing viewpoints to find solutions that are viable and sustainable. So yep. I, I, I felt it was important to point that out because there may be people that may be cowered into a position where opposing these kind of premises that have irreparable impact in our communities throughout the entire state because of the tone of the current climate. Look, no one is ever discounting it. Social quality, access and opportunity should be available for every, every group. We are working toward that. These solutions that are being offered only increase density. They don't solve the critical need for affordable, accessible and diverse housing in every community in our state, not yeah. just the suburbs. So, so let me just, let me just jump in for a minute because Mark, Mark. Requiring density. I think it's really important to note that though. There's there's not, we removed the section of the bill so, that had the, the multifamily development. It bears so repeating though, because as we've heard many times, those types of things find their way back into the bills. And, okay, and, and so, so it, it, it's, it's very time worthwhile out. to talk about it. <laughs> Mark Barnhouse has to leave because he has to go to another affordable housing meeting because this is what we do now in our town, post affordable housing 8-30G meetings because our, our town is so aggravated and frustrated being dictated by people who don't live here. And so I just want to say Mark has to depart. <laughs> And, and listen, I know that, and, uh, and Laura actually has a commitment as well. Listen, this is very emotional. And I, I, like I said at the beginning of the forum, we all have different opinions. We, I don't think there's a right or wrong here. All I, I think what people are concerned about in our community is that we want to have control over our own town. We don't want to be told what to do. And frankly, groups that say, that are that are that are um, titled desegregate Connecticut, you know, it, it's just so negative. Um, and and honestly, I feel like there's all these camps now, and here we are in our little town, well, it's not so little anymore, uh, trying to manage and 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 comply with all of the things, not just the mandates on zoning, the mandates on education, the mandates on this, the mandates on that. There's so many mandates. Um, I just think what we're, what we're asking here um, 
I'm asking, <laughs> the first select woman, and I think our community is asking, is please touch base with us, even if it's a call at 12 o'clock at night from outside the hall of the house to say, hey, first select woman, here's the language now. What do you think? Mr. Barnhart, you'll pick up the phone at midnight, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you think about this language? You know, because, 24 seven. <laughs> I mean, I used to take pictures of bill language and send it to our local people to, hey, what do you think? Because, you know, at the end of the day, you represent this community and we're the ones that have to actually manage the community. And there's a very, very different thing about being a legislator and passing bills that you like and actually then having to be here implementing it. So that's all I think I'm asking the people who work for our town, Mark, Jim Went, um, and people who are elected like Matt Wagner who have to deal with this um, all the time is in our community just asking that um that we be kept up to date on these changes because we know they can change really quickly and madam first select woman to that end i'm happy to come meet with you on friday after we get back from session and talk through any part of the bill the bill language that you want i've, I've same thing to any delegation member as well i do just want to reiterate the, the conversation around the required density and to Mr. Wagner's point that we should still be talking about these things because things make their way back into bills. I removed those sections. That's great. Thank so you very much. I, am, I would just ask you to pay attention to how it would affect Fairfield. Nobody had any idea how 830G was going to impact Fairfield 30 years later. Right. Okay. And we don't know the impact of fair share, how that's going to impact Fairfield 20 years from now. All right. We've been given and I've lived with a regime of a statutory construction that we now have experience with. Right. We now know the dictates we need to work within and we're working towards those points and so on and so forth to change the rules of the game on our municipality and all the others at this late stage would be devastating. And doing that in a way with a bill, with, with legislation, that you have a, no idea how that is going to impact our community or any other community, I, I think is just, it's, 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 it's not right uh, and, and shouldn't be tolerated. It shouldn't be tolerated by you or, or anybody else. Thank you all. I'm sorry I have Thank to Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. I'm sorry Thanks, Mark. I have another meeting. <laughs> <laughs> we can all take a deep breath on June 10th. Hopefully. Exhale and do uh, actually, Hopefully. First select woman, if I may, I know this is a zoning forum, but the, the place I was planning to head tonight is uh, the Connecticut State PCA. And I will just give a shout out to one of our former central office folks who's now the superintendent of Milford, who's receiving the award, and Paul Cavana, our own Fairfield Wood, or excuse me, Fairfield Ward, excuse me, I can't even speak. Uh, is receiving an award as well as uh, Ms. Rafiopo, a teacher award. So uh, congrats to them. Since I'm not there with them, I'll give them a shout out here on Fair TV. And, and please, I, I would also offer my congratulations and, and gratitude for all of our teachers. And uh, uh, it's been a difficult year and, and they have done incredible work. Um, and I want to give a shout out to uh, obviously uh, Superintendent Cummings and the entire uh, teaching advocacy and uh, I, I wish you know I could have gone as well but uh, we're up in Hartford uh, doing the people's work well I, I just want to say I really appreciate all of you taking the time to be here um, we you know our residents are calling and emailing so much and about all of this and I think this is a very helpful and uh, welcome bit of information where I can now share this um, when people email or, or call the office just so they can hear the, the dialogue. I know we didn't get a chance to talk a lot about 8-30G, but I do have other links on the uh, Fair TV where I have had just sole conversations about the, that legislation um, that I can share with the community who, who maybe uh, hadn't heard that before. And of course, you're all, all always available to our residents to talk about that. So um, I just, I, I hope everybody had a chance to learn something today and, um, Thank you, everyone, for, for participating. I really do appreciate it.
Thank you, Thank uh, you. Madam First Select Woman. Now, this is going to be public Thank record. You that uh, we could share broadly uh, from a transparency point. So thank you. It's recorded on Fair TV. And, uh, Jerry usually puts it up like the next day. Fantastic. Um, thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. And it, and, and just uh, for anyone who didn't get a chance to have their questions answered, um, you can email me, uh, bcupchick at fairfieldct.org. I can send you the legislator's uh, information, um, or we can try to answer any other questions you have. Matt, did you want to say something, Matt? I just want to say thank you, Madam Selectwoman Kupchik, and all of my fellow panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Wendt. <laughs> Thanks.